Hello and welcome to Murder Analyzed. I'm Christina Moore. Now today's case is the Moore's murders case. So these crimes took place between 1963 and 1965, but this case continues on right up until 2017 really. And as we go through this case, you will see why. Okay, so um, this case is a disturbing case. So really there is some content in this video that some people may find upsetting. So a little bit of a warning there before we start. So the Moore's murderers are based on um, two serial killers. Okay, they're children, uh, serial children killers. And um, their um, ranges range, the kids range from the age of 10 to 16, 17, so young adults, okay, as well. Gruesome murders, horrific murders, especially at this time, okay. So the, the reason I'm going to do this video in three parts, okay, so part one, part two, part three, is because this case is one, the content is so large, but also the content is so important because if you're going to tell the story or the case of the Moore's murderers, I think you have to do it justice, okay, and make sure that you cover every aspect of it. Because to, for you to gauge the true um, personality of these two killers, okay, and so these killers are Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. So I think before we start, I think grab yourself a coffee and let's have a chat about murder, okay? Okay, so we're going to start right at the beginning, and I think we're going to start with Ian Brady. So um, Ian Brady was born in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, um, in uh, January 1938. So he was um, born to a woman who was unmarried at the time. So again, in a lot of these cases, when we look back, um, in 1938, in Scotland or anywhere in England, you know, it, it, it wasn't acceptable really, it wasn't, it was frowned upon to have a child out of wedlock. Plus, what, what was happening in them days is that today people have benefits and they have universal credits and they have income support and all this sort of stuff to help them. Well, in 1938, there was none of that. If you wanted this money, you literally had to go and, and beg for it. So this woman had to work okay his mother had to work so Ian was born um, Ian Duncan Stewart okay that's his name at birth um, and his mother was Margaret they, they called her Peggy and uh, uh, shortened for Margaret and but she was a tea room waitress okay so she didn't have a lot of income she then got pregnant she couldn't have give up her income she would have still had to work because there was no father around. Now there was things saying that his father was, um, you know, died before he was born, but no one really knows, okay? And, you know, a lot of people made up stories then about what happens to the fathers, but it's actually um, thought that it was a one night stand and, and she just became pregnant. So she, because she had no money and she had to work, because she was a worker, and then she's had this child. What she's done then is advertised, you know, locally for someone to take on this child. Not that she wanted to give him away because that wasn't her intention, but she couldn't afford to keep him. And this happened so much in them days, you wouldn't believe it about, you know, uh, there was so much poverty around and, and you just couldn't get any help as a single person. So she's advertised for him to be, um, so for someone to look after him, bring him up as their own, and she would pay them so much per week to help with that upkeep. So then a family, a local family, came forward um, and said that they would take him. Now these weren't a rich family, these were a working class family as well, they had four children of their own. I think they felt sorry for her and they did take on then Ian as, of, as their own and looked after him and um, he took on their name then of Ian Sloan, okay? So that he became part of that family. But she then, the mother, Peggy, continued to visit him weekly. And this went on for quite a few years. But as 
Peggy then became um, more independent and she met somebody else and she met a man called um, Patrick Brady. All right? He was an Irish man, um, flower market man, and they moved from Scotland then to Manchester. Now that was then leaving Ian in um, Scotland with the Sloanes, who again were very, very good people. And he even says himself, they sort of looked after him. But he also says about them that they had four children of their own and he felt like an outsider, okay? Because when the mother was visiting him, he actually didn't know it was his mother, Peggy, that was visiting. He just thought it was a friend who used to bring in gifts and she was a very nice person. It wasn't until much later on that he found out that Peggy was his actually mother. Now, again, this happened a lot in that time where you'd have people brought up, not through adoption or anything else, but through choice, you know, of, of the two mutual um, families to bring up these kids. So I, either the nan would bring them up, and, you know, someone else then would bring them up as their own. So this wasn't an abnormal thing in them days. It was, it was actually quite normal. So um, rather than giving him into care, that was the, the next best thing to do. So now Peggy and Patrick are in Manchester and the Sloanes and Ian are still in Scotland, okay? So as he becomes about 13, 12, 13, he gets into an academy because he was a quite a bright child, um, set a little bit above average. And it is said a lot, about serial killers that you know or the myth is that they're above average intelligence this that and the other well they're not really you know um a lot of serial uh, some serial killers are uh, and and some serial killers have got very low in, in intelligence so i think he just had he was an above intelligent child uh and he got into this school uh this academy for sort of kids you know um that were sort of you know <laughs> gifted i suppose in some way but not not especially gifted but he even says himself that he um loved to steal he just had this compulsion and so really um you know when he left this academy at 16 and then he took a menial jobs really he began as a butcher's messenger boy and and that sort of thing and um he sort of was already at that age in juvenile court. Now, you know, we look now when we, we think when we have kids that got everything and they sort of take this path. Um, in them days there was a lot of poverty, so it could have been even that. He was drawn, he needed money, he didn't want to really earn it, he was earning little bits of money, and he, he, he sort of um, was in juvenile court for quite a lot, you know, for housebreaking, right? So. It's not just a little bit of theft, this is house breaking. So you're breaking in at 15 to someone's home. Now there's a lot of risk involved, you know, with, um, with that. So it's a quite a young age to start actually breaking into people's home. It's a lot different than stealing from a shop or, or just stealing something. House breaking is a different level of criminality because you're invading in someone else's home. The risk of you getting caught is higher. Also, you know your fear level can't be that high because he was never worried about being really cool he just wanted this stuff that belonged to other people so we're sort of seeing even around 15 his personality has already changed i mean it said they said at school that he was just he you know he was he always wanted to be right and he was you know he had a lot of friends and stuff so um but he liked to be in control and I think this progression onto um, housebreaking and, and stealing stuff is not an influence from someone else. He was the one deciding to do this. Most kids, you know, are either followers or leaders. He was definitely a leader, okay? So he chose his own route and, and followed it, really. So he then, um, was getting into so much trouble that again he appeared in court um, on nine separate charges okay which is you know it's, it's, that's a lot of charges okay to have and at this point 
it was just before his 17th birthday and he was placed on probation uh, again for an array of, of um, theft charges and stuff like that so he was just 17 and, and there was a lot of charges now against him and um, he was looking at I think um, probation or in prison but if he took the probation he would have to leave Scotland and go and live in Manchester with his mother because I think by this stage Glasgow had, had enough of him you know he was in, in and out of juvenile he's now got nine charges that he's in he, he was going to spend a couple of years in prison so Ian then Sloan decides to go and live with his mother um, Peggy and Pat Market is a merchant so he's got a job and also he gets on really well with Patrick. I think Patrick was a very nice easy going and, and, and so was the mother. They were very nice people. I think the mother's background is mainly only through circumstance. They were quite good people. Okay so they worked and they had a life and then all of a sudden you have now Ian coming to live with them and he's then took on um, the name of Brady. So he's took on Patrick's name uh, and then got little bits of jobs and stuff and then Patrick got him this job um, in this market and then he was caught for stealing lead seals. Now lead is even this day, you know, day and age, um, people steal lead because they can weigh it in and they can get that that money. So again, he hasn't changed any of his traits. He's literally just moved to Manchester, took on a new name and started again. Okay, so he was caught for that. He was caught and um, he was, um, I think, sentenced to two years for that um, in a ball stall. And uh, he's just, he was just, because he was still about 17. Anyway, so in January 1959, um, Brady um, applied for a clinical, a clinical job at um, Millwards. Um, it was a wholesale chemical distribution company, that sort of thing, in Gorton in uh, Manchester. Now he was a um, he was regarded, I suppose, by his colleagues as quite a quiet man. Kept himself to himself, um, very punctual. You know, quite punctual. Didn't have much time off and wasn't really late. But he was a bit short-tempered, he said, and. Um, he was sort of he would he just got along with it they knew about his criminal record because in them days you know i think to get the job he, he would have had to have said it but um i think he, he was just this he, he loved nazis and he loved all this stuff and he loved you know reading books about it so he sort of thought of himself as this educated man you know I read books, but the books he was reading were about the atrocities of Nazis. Now, don't forget, you know, this is um, 1957, where he is, you know, the war hasn't been over that long. You know, England, England really didn't care much for Hitler, you know, let alone, you know, and the people did read about the atrocities of, of it. Of course they did, because it was there. They didn't actually go to libraries and start reading books and really loving this culture, this Nazism culture that he seemed to love, okay? So anyway, let's now, I think, move on to um, Hindley. Now, she was born in Manchester right, in 1942, in July 1942, and she was raised in Gorton, right? So she was raised there. Her parents were Natalie and Bob, and um, they, again, in this area of Manchester, a poor area, working class area, but listen, in 1942, most working class areas were classed as poor areas. You know, people were struggling to meet ends, uh, ends meet, and, and so Natalie and Bob, um, had got a little room and, and stuff and and um and i think bob was actually um an ex army man so he had fought in the war and he was in the parachute regiment and stuff and he was known actually in the army as quite a hard man all right and i think when he came back from the army 
he came back as a lot of soldiers did in them days you know struggling to get into normal normal life again you've been in this army you've seen things in this army that would have changed you and also his personality was this strong man you know quite aggressive in some ways and i think that coming from this war and that experience of the war made him even more so so by the time he gets home um they had myra already but by the time he then gets home so she didn't have i suppose a father figure early on because he was at war but then in them days a lot of people didn't have a father figure around and there was a war but the community i think even in this poor areas of England when this war was going on. The communities were very good. So um, I think with, uh, I think her name's Nellie actually, it's Nellie and Bob. So Nellie, the mother, um, had, um, and her mother really helped and brought up um, Myra Hindley because he was away. And Myra and um, uh, Nellie, the mother, lived with the grandmother while the father was away at war, okay? So when he then came back from war, it was then time to move on and get your own property. Now, when we say get your own property, you know, these are not big houses where you've got everything going on. You had um, a small house with, in, with one room where um, the father and mother would have one bed, the double bed, and then Myra was in a single bed in the same room, okay? So, but again, quite normal. Sometimes you'd have six or seven kids share in one room in them days. So nothing abnormal, okay, in, in that. So then um, at that same time, then um, Nellie became pregnant with Maureen, and that is Myra Hindley's sister, okay? So again now, We've, you haven't got a lot of money, you've got a man now that's really drinking, and actually then Nellie then starts to drink because to, I think to cope with what's going on, you know, this man's changed since he's come back. So then they've now had an, added another child to this scenario, and then all of a sudden at five years old, Myra Hindley is then gone to live with the Nan. Only up the road, but gone to live with the Nan. So again, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's a normal occurrence, okay, in them days. The nan and the, and the mother and the father were a family unit in them days, and, and they continued to be. But with, with Hindley's father, I think when she was about eight, I think she says it herself, is that if she came home crying because someone had picked on her or hit her or some of the kids in the street were fighting and she got hurt and she would then come home and cry and, and stuff he would get the belt out and belt her and say to her don't come home here crying stick up for yourself also he loved a bit of boxing he was a bit of a boxer so he taught her to box taught her to fight but because he'd done that he expected her to fight okay she had to stick up for herself actually both girls did have to stick up for themselves so you couldn't you know if your kids come home today and they've fallen over or the boy up the road pushed them or whatever you know it's a strange thing to be rewarded in saying well you go and beat them up and then I mean that's the proudest he's ever been of this is Myra Hindley or so she says so this is her story of what she's saying about her childhood so Myra's mother also would um sort of you know, in, I, I think, again, you have to go back to how it was in them days. You know, this man was in control of this family. This was his way. He was also a drinker. It was quite violent in this family. And uh, often that she, Myra, would then have to take Maureen, the baby, two-year-old, out to the, to the nans to get her away from the violence that was going on in this house. So you do have this going on, okay? But then... She, uh, there's conflicting stories about Myra Hindley, what she says about her mother, because she also says that her mother was also beating her and as well as the father. But then on other occasions, she would say, oh no, my mother never touched me. So there's, there is some conflicting stories about that.
okay? So I think at eight years old, um, when she went back out and hit this boy and the father praised her for doing it and stuff, she writes later on that, you know, when she was eight year old, that was her first victory, right? So this is what's going on in this child's mind. But it's also in her as an adult, because she wrote this as an adult, my first victory, victory at eight. So, you know, when you're looking at the psychology and what happens to a child, right? Yes, this would have affected her child, but also to call it a victory, because the father praised her, she then took on that, that this was the right thing to do. You know, this was right. And, and you know, no one should be beaten, but there is other ways that you can deal with um, someone picking on your child and stuff. It's not really a, a good way. Anyway, so when, um, when she was still a child, she used to take judo lessons as well, and she took judo lessons up until she was about 17, I think. Uh, once a week at the local school. She also um, then sort of went, I think, uh, or was known as a bit of a, a bully, I suppose, because of this reaction she had to anyone saying anything to her. So she would just then react rather than waiting or trying to talk to these people, she would um, react and, and fight. But on the other side of her, she also stuck up for people that wasn't um, uh, strong enough to stick up for herself. She noticed a young boy being um, regularly picked on and uh, she stepped in uh, on many occasions and to help this boy out. He was younger than her, they went to the same school and they lived in the same street. And then after a while they became friends. Now this boy, um, his name was Michael Higgins. And um, so when Myra, I think was about 13, um, she was friends with, with, with Higgins and they used to go off swimming and, 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 and stuff like that. Um, and this one day, Michael had come to her and said, Would you, you know, do you want to go swimming? But she said, no, I'm going out with other friends and um, I don't really want to go swimming. So he went swimming with other people. That afternoon, um, <laughs> there was police and everything around. Michael had actually drowned, okay? So Myra says this when she got older that this really affected her, right? Because she liked him and it was one of her friends and she felt guilty because she should have gone, you know, swimming with him. And if she had been there, because she was actually quite a good swimmer, maybe he would have been saved, okay? So she then puts that down also to part of her um, experience as a child that, um, and I suppose psychologists could even put it down to as a child but you have to wait until the end to find out about Myra Hindley's um, um, character okay so anyway as she then grows up and she uh, leaves school and again she isn't the greatest student she's um, still carrying on with her martial arts, you know, her judo once a week. She's quite a plain girl, you know, um, quite religious. I mean, she was, um, she's Catholic and she um, had a confirmation when she was, I think, 13. So she, she was quite religious, okay? So she was quite a plain girl in, in them days. Um, she so then goes off at, at 17 and she gets engaged to a um, young man. Uh, now, she had a short courtship, courtship with him and actually, um, you know, she, she sort of liked him at first. But I think, and she says it herself, is that she wanted more. He couldn't give her what she wanted out of life. This is what she's saying. I, and she means, you know, financial and, and this sort of thing. I don't think she's talking emotionally when she talks about this boy because she was with him for a short while, they got engaged and then she decided, you know, really, you know, he just, he just um, was a bit too immature for her and uh, she wanted um, to have more in life than what he could give her. So anyway, at that time, she was also working as a clerk as an engineering company. 
uh, and she lost her first week's wages or so she said and the young girls in there were um you know give her some money towards you know losing it so she wasn't disliked at work all right this girl wasn't disliked really at any point you know she didn't have loads of friends but then she didn't have no friends okay but with this sort of behavior is where she's lost her wage packet and a lot of people do you get paid on a friday and you could lose your waste packet in them days that you could do they then paid her but then this happened again and there was other things going on in this job um that then people started to think well hang on you know something not right about this girl um also she would hardly ever turn up because even though she wanted these clerical jobs or you know and, and it was literally only making tea this that and the other and a little bit of typing she couldn't even get up to go to that, you know. And so she couldn't be married either because she didn't want to be with the, the person she's just got rid of who she got engaged to. She didn't want to be in that. She wanted more, but she actually didn't want to earn it. Okay, so this is when you'll see this as it as it goes through. So anyway, she's um, then took a job at a typist again, and that's where she meets Brady because the job that she took a typist in was in Mill Wards where Brady already worked. Okay, so now this is where they meet. Okay, so don't forget she's um, now this is 1961. She's 18. Um, she's gone to this job, started this job as a as a typist, menial, but you know not it was a good job and she sort of got on all right in there but she spots Brady in the canteen when he was having drinks and she became infatuated with this man right this was the man that didn't really talk much he certainly didn't talk to her didn't have much interest in her you know she's quite a plain girl he was more interested in himself and his books his Nazism and that he was very self absorbed you know is a narcissist it, you know, that will show quite clearly and so I don't think that he thought by ignoring Hindley because he could must have seen the attention that she was trying to give him um, I, but he I don't I honestly don't believe that this man was interested in anybody right because Hindley had had um, this boyfriend before and got rid of him because she didn't think he could give her what she needed in life then all of a sudden now she's met Brady or she thinks she's met Brady because it's only a one-sided relationship here with with Brady um Brady's more interested in everything else what's going around but, but the first time so she started this job in January 1961 and it wasn't until the July right 27th of July so the end of July they actually spoke to her about anything. So that that was when he actually spoke to the girl. But by this time, she's been writing in her diary at home, if, if he looked to her, if he, you know, absolutely this infatuation. So that also now tells us a little bit about her character, to be this obsessed with someone who isn't giving you anything in response, okay? Literally nothing. So, I think as the time has gone on, she must have been over the moon on the 27th of July 1961 when this man spoke to her for the first time. So what she does is she starts then to think, how can I get this man to like me? You know, because she is now infatuated with this man. So then she decides to go and she's noticing the books he's reading, which is all about Nazis, all about this sort of stuff. I'm going to go to the library and I'm going to get a book and I'm going to then come back to work in my lunch break and start reading a book. Well, of course, then Brady did, I think, on the um, in early December, start talking to her, okay, about the books. That he, I think he thought they had a common interest, right, um, in that, because she must have been into what he was into, okay. So... <laughs> Um, about the 22nd of December there was dances as there always is around Christmas and so Brady asked her to go um, to a dance okay and of course she is now over the moon 
he's not only talking to her and they're not now only just sitting discussing about books they're now going on a date he's taking her to a dance and all this is in this diary as well as other things and stuff but every date they had was the same all right so he would take her to the movies uh usually an x-rated movie uh, or mostly always an x-rated movie then he would take her back to the grand her grandmother's home and then they would have german wine and discuss that sort of thing now all of a sudden right um hindley starts then her character starts to change her appearance starts to change she's now dyed her hair peroxide blonde she's wearing um crimson lipstick okay because what she's trying to do is not attract brady in that way because i don't think brady really cared to tell her the truth it was about this german thing of blonde hair blue eyes she didn't have blue eyes actually she had brown eyes she couldn't do much about them in them days but she wanted to look as much like this race this german race which hitler really was going for you know and um then she started to wear sort of more sexier clothes knee-high boots you know high boots short skirts her, her she started to change now there was two reasons for this one because of the, the the link to the nazism and the things that they were discussing and talking about but also she was trying to make hinley attracted to her all right and you'll see later on why it wasn't maybe the case but you know we'll go into that so her appearance then started to change she then became more confident in herself plus by this time she was then having sexual relations with brady and then relations were you know um sadomasochistic i think in 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 its form okay um so her, her then what she says is her first sexual experience was quite violent quite you know dangerous but she seemed to like it okay because she stayed okay but she did write to her friend once and say that she felt that um uh, brady had drugged her you know but again you, you just never know with myra hinley but anyway at this point now they're now a couple so they're going to work now she looks like this blonde bombshell the crimson lipstick going to work in the sexy clothes they are now sitting in the calf in their workplace calf reading their nazi books out loud out loud to each other but then everyone else in this room can hear it and, and not everyone really wanted to know that and then they go on to um ignoring everybody else you know and this is where now things start to change okay so we um uh so now now we've got hinley and brady as this couple right they're now a you know this this unbreakable couple she is still infatuated with him she is in love with him and she um they start deciding i suppose what then to do because brady comes across so manipulative anyway in, in and he always has to be right he now wants to rob banks right because don't forget right from when he was a childhood his mentality was i want that but i can't i don't want to earn it i just want to take it her mentality is I want more out of life. She's already dumped her fiance that she felt couldn't give her that life and wanted more. So now this couple are now thinking, how are we going to get the lifestyle we want? Not by earning it, but by stealing it. So they now plan to rob banks. So Hinley goes off to learn how to shoot. Now the ex fiance of Hinley was. Um, uh, like a manager of a shooting club okay a proper shooting club and Hindley, for some reason he couldn't understand why 
asked could she come in and learn to shoot and could he get her a gun, a rifle, right? Uh, and so he couldn't really understand it. Anyway, he allowed um, Ruth to join the shooting club and she wasn't a great shot and she became very angry a lot of times when she couldn't make these shots. And um, she also asked him, could he get her this rifle, which he didn't get, but she did buy a, 30, uh, a 45 caliber pistol from um, someone else within this gun club, um, which I don't think he knew about, but she did buy that. But in the end, because of her attitude towards um, her and her anger she exhibited when she was firing and, and not getting it right, um, he actually asked her and said, it's not really, you know, I don't think this club is for you and shooting for you. And he sort of asked her to leave. So her going to learn to shoot was about planning robberies with um, Brady, right? Now, not that Brady ever picked up a gun, didn't do any of the hard work himself because that's what he had her for, okay? And, but anyway, they're planning this, this robbery and, um, you know, they're getting all the plans together. But I think because then she wasn't what Brady thought she was in this great shot, yes, she was willing to do a robbery, she was willing to do anything, to get some money and a different life, lifestyle that they wanted and it would have never have been enough, okay? So I think the them sort of plans um, fell by the wayside. He knew that she didn't have it in her. He certainly didn't have it in him, you know, to to go and even learn and shoot a gun. He says he was, you know, infatuated, he's fascinated with guns, he loves guns. He'd never picked up a gun in his life. But so th you'll know more about Brady as we go through. So anyway, the manager said she was unsuitable, so she's gone. So then the pair took up photography. So Brady had already started um, photography a while ago, but then all of a sudden he, he's really getting into this photography. They used to go up, they used to go out, you know, day trips and take photos anyway. But then he sort of get, got some more sophisticated um, equipment, you know, dark room equipment, and you know all this sort of stuff a, a better camera and um i think then it was they used to go up onto saddleworth moor and then take photos they used to take the dog up there you know um pop it up there this dog um hindley had up and they used to take photos and and so you know lots of people have um an interest in photography and he liked the outdoor space he liked to go away and his, and his um, parents said that, that they used to like, he used to like to go out and he was more of an outside person. Um, and that'll come um, into play later on as well with that. But I think with, with Hindley now, they've, and, and Brady, they've got to this point where they don't want to rob banks, probably because the fear of getting caught, and the intelligence wasn't there to rob a bank really and get away with it for these pair absolutely not and so the next thing is that um brady said right was that he wanted to plan the perfect murder now we sort of got his story um from this book compulsion this is where he got this idea or so he says where he got this idea um, now, Compulsion was a story about two well-to-do young lads that committed a murder of a 12-year-old boy. All fiction, right? This is fiction. And how they escaped the death penalty, because don't forget, when this book was wrote, the death penalty was in, right? So this is what now him and Myra are discussing, okay? Now, you know, <laughs> people that watch this channel, I discuss murders and stuff, we, in, 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 in our arena of our work and what we do. But he was discussing how to commit the perfect murder because he wanted to do the murder. He wanted to become a murderer, okay? And she was so compliant with this. She thought it was a great idea. You know, don't forget, they can't do the bank robberies. Oh, wait, let's go to now murder. So don't forget this book, Compulsion, talks about a 12-year-old. And... Um, being murdered 
and also it says in there because don't forget it's all about how to plan this perfect murder and I think in this compulsion book one of them left their glasses there and that's how it was found that then they was called for this murder again fiction okay this is fiction so then Brady then starts to really plan a murder okay now they're in it together what they can and can't do he worked it out with every detail of what they can and can't do and what they need to do to not get caught for this murder but then they're going to discuss okay who are we going to murder who are we going to what's going to be the people that we murder they decide or Brady decides it's got to be children you know because he's quite a weak man this man he can't even pick up a gun he knows that if he goes for an adult an adult's going to fight absolutely and this man is no way strong enough to do that so he goes to the weakest thing he thinks that he can and this and in his perverted mind uh, he's going to now go for children so both him and uh, Hindley start them to um, drive around you know oh and actually before I say about him driving around Hindley he made again Hindley drive he used to drive a motorbike but he needed Hindley to drive you know in his perfect plan you know this perfect murder no one's going to suspect a woman so you need to drive so now he's she's gone for her driving test she failed actually three times uh, and passed on her fourth time and so then she they've hired she's hired this van um again why do you why do we think a van it's all in the planning of this murder right this is all of it the driving he's on the motorbike the test she needs a test let's hire the van you know all this planning leading up now if they hadn't planned that lot these murders probably would have started earlier and don't forget they haven't been together that long so these murders were 1963 to 1964 we're nearly in 1962 now and they've already planned on bank robbery no let's now move on to murdering children so all this planning and it was clearly planned over a long period of time okay so now she's got this van and she's now driving and they're driving around looking for potential victims looking at schools now in them days these days we have schools now with fences up and everything else but even when I was at school we didn't have fences because we didn't really have this or so people thought and that's all you ever hear really is in my day that didn't happen well yes it did but in, in them days we didn't there wasn't fences and 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 uh, you know especially in, in in the 60s kids were kids and kids had innocent childhoods and that's was how people related you know they, these kids were allowed to be out and allowed to play until nine o'clock at night in the summer not so much in the in in um in the in the winter but you know that was life in them days so of course they were driving around looking for potential victims so now he's a stalker both of them are now they're homing in their skills how are we going to do it he knows he's got his plan and he's got his plan that he doesn't want to be caught because when this was going on don't forget the death penalty was there so he didn't want to get caught either and go in and to, the, to be hanged in this country and nor did she so <clears throat> a lot of planning went into this so they couldn't find anyone at the school it was a bit too risky they thought just to take someone from the school grounds or, or walking home from school so they went out and they traveled around and they knew this day that they was going to um, kill someone so now it's the 12th of July uh, 1963 okay and they're driving around looking for a victim to kill a child now you've got Hindley driving the van and then you've got Brady on his motorbike following behind now when they're going to find a potential victim for Brady because remember Brady's in charge here um, he's going to flash his headlights on the motorcycle right, motorbike and she's then going to pull over because she's then going to pick the child up so they driving along the street and all of a sudden Brady's um, 
headlights flash. And Myra can see it, and she can see there's an eight-year-old child that lived a few doors down from her nan. But she decides to keep on going, not to stop for that victim. So he pulls her over down the road and said, why didn't you stop? I flashed you, I wanted that child. And she said, oh, I couldn't because she lives only a few doors away from my nan and she's eight and I think that they would be looking more for an eight year old. So he then lets her off because by this time his child has gone, luckily for her, she has gone. And they get back in the car and they start now looking for somebody else, okay? So they drive a couple of miles down the road. He flashes his headlights again. There's a young girl walking along the street, okay? She's in a blue coat, lovely white shoes and a, and a pink dress, okay? She's going off to a dance. She's all done up. She's only 16 and she's um, making her way to this dance. Now, he's flashing now thinking, well, she's going to stop for this one because she wouldn't stop for the eight-year-old. This one's a bit older. So she does pull over. Now, I think the reason she pulled over is one, because she knew this girl. And this girl was Pauline Reed. okay? Now, this girl, Pauline Reed, this first victim of theirs, was friends with Maureen, um, uh, Hindley's sister, okay? She'd gone, she was at school with them, so, and so they knew her. So, and also she had recently just finished with a boy called David Smith. Now David Smith will come in a little bit later on, but remember his name, because he's important to this case. And she had finished with him and then she was um, now single and she was a quite a shy girl, very well liked girl, pretty girl, you know, but she, Myra pulls over. Of course, Pauline knows her and she says to Pauline, would you like a lift to the dance? So of course, Pauline's got new white shoes on, all dressed up, how lovely. You know, in them days, cars, not everyone had a car. I'm going in this car, I'm going to this dance, she can drop me off. She's got in the car. You know, no one's gonna suspect anything, one, because she knew her, and two, because she was a woman. Now, we have in our mind, I think, before we carry on with this, about women don't kill or are not serial killers. Yes, they do, okay? But I think it's hard for us when we talk to our kids about strangers, don't get in a car with strangers, don't, you know, these men, these men, these men. No, don't get in a car with women either. You know, this is the thing. People just seem to think that that's not, and we, you know, and I think in them days anyway, yes, they were told, you know, don't get in a car with strangers, there was things going on, there was other things going on, but don't get in a car, but she, Pauline wouldn't have fought any danger at all in getting in this car with Myra Hindley. So she gets in the car, and then as she's in the car and they're driving along, Pauline actually asks Myra, oh, are you all right? Because she was nervous, okay? And she said, oh, yes, yes. And she said, oh, look, before I take you to your dance, I've lost my really expensive glove on the moor, on Saddleworth Moor. Can you come and help me find it? Well, of course. This girl's appreciative of a, of a, a lift. Uh, whether she wanted to say no, um, because she was quite a shy, a shy girl. So she just said yes. So again, they drive up to Saddleworth Moor, and behind them then is Brady on his motorbike. So she introduces uh, Pauline to Brady. This is my boyfriend. He's, you know, here, take you over and have a look for my glove, okay? So the girl gets out the car and walks onto the moors with Brady. Now this is Hindley's story, okay? Which is important. So she then, takes her, Hindley sits in the car, knowing what's gonna to happen to this girl. So she knows she's gonna be murdered because this was the whole plan, wasn't it, of murdering a child. So you know this girl, your sister knows this girl, you know this girl, you've now given her to a man that you know is gonna murder her, or so you say. 
So he's took her on to Saddleworth Mall. He has raped her. And you, I could tell by her clothing she was raped. He had slit her throat, nearly decapitating her. He had put a four inch slice, deep slice, through her voice box. And her, her blue coat was shoved into the hole, I think, to stop her making any sound. And then he goes back to the car for Hindley. This is again Hindley's story. And says, um, it's done. Right? So Hindley says, did you have sex with her? He went, of course I did. So this is Hindley's story. Then, because earlier on in that day they'd already hidden a shovel and everything else up on Saddleworth Moor, they then then come and got the um, shovel and buried um, buried uh, Pauline, okay, up on the moor. Now, and then they, it was stated they went home in front of the fire, laid there and drunk their wine and talked about this experience of this murder. Now, that's Hindley's story. Brady's story, right, is that exactly that, what happened leading up to her getting out of the car and going on to Saddleworth Moor, happened, right? He agrees with that. But what he says is, is that she was as much part of that murder and the sexual assault on Pauline as he was. Now there was two slices on her neck, right? You know, and then the cut on the voice box, which tells you something, right? You didn't need to have two slices. One would, would already been enough. So it could show that there was someone else there, okay? In them days, you know, you're talking in the 60s, we didn't have what we have to say, well, we can tell a really a lot from this, a body that's left like that about how many victims there was. Plus, when we look now back, uh, uh, this is why this case is so important, to tell the whole story, all of it, all of it. So, um, <laughs> to get back in their car after this, so yes, she did, she was part of this murder, okay? Now, um, Pauline <laughs> had a good family, came from a very good family, a very well-liked girl, very nice but the police you know the, the the family are now looking because this girl has not turned up home you know um it's now getting late the dance is finished that her mum pauline's mother goes to the dance to see if she can find um anything with this girl and they said well we don't know anyone that's coming in a pink dress and a pink coat a, a blue coat i don't think she's been here her friends hadn't seen her no one's seen her Okay, so there's no evidence, again, we didn't have CCTV like we do today. There was no evidence of this girl and this disappearance. She literally just vanished, just vanished. And <coughs> the boyfriend, um, her ex-boyfriend, he was 15 at the time, um, David, um, David Smith, who again later becomes relevant in these cases, was questioned over her murder, but was eliminated actually uh, quite quickly after. But again, now the police, you know, are still looking for this girl. No one's heard anything. No one's found anything. The, the public are out looking. Everyone's looking. No one can find her. So they've really got away with it, haven't they? Now the thing is, what you've got to think of with Brady when he was doing this murder and how how he relates back to this compulsion book, was he even checked to make sure the buttons were on each other, they hadn't left anything, there was no evidence left around that, you know, could potentially put them in the frame for this murder. You know, he had then, when they'd finished the murder, buried the body, he put the shovel into a plastic bag and put it in the car. The car then was nothing. They then got the ramp out, put his motorbike into the back of the van, Put that away so now they're now a couple just driving around and then going back to the house for their wine and whatever they was doing to discuss this perfect murder so that was murder number one okay now murder number two is john kilbride and he was 12 years old right 
and he was murdered on the 21st, uh, 23rd of November uh, 1963. So I'm going to leave that until the next video. Okay, so video two, which will be out tomorrow or the next day. So for now, this has been The Moore's Murder, part one. Okay, and so I hope you found this interesting. This now case only gets worse, right? There is nothing nice in this next uh, one and parts one and two, uh, part two and three. So anyway, I hope you found this interesting and you know it's you know what to do i say it every time <laughs> every time thumbs up if you liked it and i'd really like to hear some comments so you know and i do say let's have a chat about murder meaning let's have a chat about murder um so that thumbs up subscribe um on the subscribe button um also i think with um youtube now you have to you know open up your notifications to get notifications of the cases that are coming out the cases that are coming out, not only just these two, but are cases that may have two, uh, two or three um, videos that go with them because the cases are big and long and that. So it's a really good thing to open up your notifications. Again, don't forget, you can follow us on um, Facebook and on Instagram. Okay, so until the next time, and I'll see you in part two. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.